Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, attending today's webinar session on mainframe modernization, how to minimize risk and prepare your roadmap to the cloud. I'll be your host today. My name is Dan Shacoin. I'm the head of marketing and partnerships at FNTS. A few housekeeping items before we get started. You'll notice there's a chat um, room to your right. Feel free to go ahead and add um, any questions as we go through the presentation today. We will be saving time at the end of the webinar to answer questions and do a Q&A. So go ahead and just add those and we'll keep track as we go. We will be recording today's session. So afterwards, we will be sending out an email with a link to the recording as well for you. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's panel. First up, we have Scott Spiro. Scott um, has over 35 years experience in consulting sales and partner development. Scott Spiro is responsible for the mainframe to Azure go to market for banking and capital markets in the US, as well as the Northeast and Canada. Scott has over 20 years of experience in the migration of mainframe and mid range workloads to the Microsoft platform. So welcome, Scott. Thank you, Dan. Next, we have Walter Sweat. Walter is the Chief Technology Officer at Estadia. Officer at Estadia. Walter has over 40 is a 40 year plus seasoned veteran working on mainframe applications and mainframe migration and modernization projects. He has held roles such as developer, development manager, project manager, and architect with Fortune 500 companies such as GT Software, Home Depot. Napa Auto Parts, Ashland Chemical, and Dale. Today, Walter focuses on helping companies who are interested in exploring mainframe migration and modernization options. So Dan, welcome, thank you very Walter. much. And finally, we have Chris Williamson. Uh, as FNTS's Field Chief Technology Officer, Chris William assists in developing strategic partnerships and long-term digital transformation initiatives with clients. Chris has an extensive knowledge of service offerings and partner-driven solutions to provide organizations with a deep understanding of FNTS's capabilities and technical solutions to meet overall growth strategies. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Again, thanks for taking the time today to join us. Um, a very timely topic, um, mainframe modernization in, in our industry and space. So, you know, to get started, mainframe modernization, the word itself is kind of that new buzzword, right, in, in our industry. And, and I think if you ask one person what mainframe modernization means compared to the other, you might get a couple different answers. So today we're going to specifically focus in on what we call the three re's, rehosting, refactoring, and then ultimately replatforming. So I'm sure those of you on the call, you know, picture yourself, you probably have been tasked in the past or, or currently from a leadership to really identify how to make the mainframe more efficient. So that could either be by a cost savings um, perspective, software savings, getting out of owning the hardware itself, or you might even possibly have aging staff that's going into retirement, right? And not being able to support the mainframe on site anymore. So today we really wanna address like, you know, how do you start to identify that strategy and roadmap to modernizing your mainframe and, and ultimately, uh, you know, finding that end target solution in a cloud environment. So to start, we're gonna uh, first focus on, um, you know, how do I get started? So Walter, tell us, you know, when a client comes to you and they're like, you know, again, I've been tasked with, you know, looking for these different strategies. What's the first thing that your organization would recommend or do for a, a client looking and for those that? those first steps are so critically important. And I'm glad that you recognize that as well. And I think that Scott and Chris would agree with this also that the most important thing that someone can do when they're starting this investigation and exploration of options, the art of the possible, if you can, is to understand where they're coming from. Uh, we think that an assessment of a, a company's IT environment so that we all have a proper understanding of what they have in place today is critical. Um, over the years, we've too often seen people who think, gosh, if I just handle code and move it off to a new environment or convert it to something else and I do the same for data that 
I'm going to be successful. Well, there's a lot more that goes into the mainframe, a very complex creature, as we all know, than just code and data. There are all of the third party products, job schedulers and security and custom printing solutions that are there. So we think it's critical to have a, a starting mapping point that says, here's everything that's in my, my mainframe environment today. I, of course, need to know what technologies and how many of everything there are. But more importantly, I may want to know what the dependencies are between all of those different components. Um, I need to know how we interface to the third party components. If I'm a customer or a company considering my mainframe alternatives, uh, whether I'm rehosting, refactoring or replatforming. Um, I also feel that it's important to understand the complexities of the application. And complexities is a, obviously a broad ranging topic. Uh, it may talk about some of the classic ones like cyclomatic complexity or Halstead complexity that look at the challenges that you can expect to have with code if you rewrite versus refactor versus replatform versus moving to a new environment. Um, you want to have a proper understanding of what's missing. And all too often there are pieces missing. Um, beauty of the mainframe, it works the same way every day in the same great way. But that means that a program that was written 40 years ago and last compiled 40 years ago, that source may be gone. And that leads you to have to consider different alternatives when you encounter that scenario. So understanding what might be missing so that you can better define how to handle those scenarios is really, really important. The other thing that we encounter often with clients that we want to know early on is who owns your applications? Uh, are you using a third party app uh, where you can only use the code that's provided to you? Uh, do you have the right to move that to a different mainframe platform? And if so, what are the implications of doing so? Um, and that kind of investigation through automated tooling and through discovery process where seasoned subject matter experts sit with client seasoned subject matter experts leads to a better understanding of that before state. And once you get an understanding of the before state, that really is where you start to be able to start to help organizations define what is that art of the possible? What are the patterns that are out there? The three reads that you talked about, you know, based on the components of their environment, are they better suited to say, I want to save money, so I want to get to a lower cost platform, but I'm still going to stay on the mainframe. Obviously a, a great example for many, uh, many customers. Do they want to replatform? And does it make more sense because of the characteristics of the code or the data that they could do things like leave vSAM as vSAM? Or if they have an overriding organizational goal to, you know, take data types and move it to something else. I'll use the vSAM example again. If I wanted to move vSAM to relational, there are characteristics of each of those components that kind of define what the options might be for them to consider. And the one thing I would then add that's most important, and I kind of alluded to it before, you have to have a mapping of everything that you have on the mainframe today and a replacement for it in the future. And the replacement may be, we don't need it anymore, uh, but you have to understand that. If it's a job scheduler, you've got to figure out the optimum job scheduler. Uh, if they have customized security, you've got to be able to have a replacement for that. So going into the process of understanding where you're starting leads to the ability to say, after I've done this discovery environment assessment, I kind of know where I'm heading. Um, and in every successful project on which our organization has ever worked, uh, that assessment has been the most critical piece that's out there. Now, Chris, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I, I mentioned that I thought that, um, you know, this was probably critical for everybody on this panel. Can you talk a little bit about just for the um, re that is for associated with rehost? You know, what does that really mean for organizations? How does that work? 
from your organization's viewpoint. Sure. Yeah, sure, Walter. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that one of the the key strategies and one of the per, first re's is rehosting. Um, and and then for this conversation, we'll just kind of define that as a situation where an organization you know owns and operates a mainframe, either it's in their own data center on premise, or maybe they've co-located it, uh, but moves their workloads to a, a managed environment, uh, you know, to uh, to host that uh, that system. Uh, and going forward, those workloads can be either kind of fully managed or maybe co-managed with the client, um, but the, the, the mainframe is no longer in the building, so to say. Um, and this is typically done through services like mainframe as a service or cloud mainframe. Providers have different names for it. Uh, and, and it's an approach to that is often called lift and shift, right? So, and, and I think that also, it, it tends to, to, to have a, get a bad rap from time to time as if, uh, uh, that is a, a no change strategy. It's not really changing anything at all. But in fact, in a while, the the workloads will remain safe and intact when when they uh, they rehosted. A lot can change actually about uh, the operational costs and and maybe the performance characteristics of those workloads in a rehost situation. Um, I think the first big thing that rehosting can do is is reduce costs, and this is obviously you know a key factor for. For most CIOs, former, as a former CIO myself, we're, we're always looking for ways to increase, uh, you know, uh, keep keep budget, um, and those cost savings can come from things like lower software costs due to the economies that uh, the larger MSPs have through their software agreements spanning many clients. There's there's better um, uh, better pricing there, and it also breaks the cycle of having to write big checks to refresh capital. Uh, around mainframe hardware, whether that's the mainframe directly or the subsystems around it, uh, which is something I hear from my my CFO friends uh, you know, periodically. Um, so that's a key factor. Uh, another one is really reducing risk, and this is really kind of the the other big um, you know, pivot point for most organizations, um, uh, and and a key driver for modernization is is putting those workloads in the hands of teams that really specialize in mainframe operations. Uh, and have built the skills you know, across the, the various tools and have deep teams of resources now um, that are, are getting harder and harder to find and keep uh, over time. Um, and additionally, a lot of these uh, managed service providers um, uh, have adjacent DR and backup services that are, 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 are part of that portfolio uh, and that even reduces the risk even further as you uh, rehost. Um, another significant opportunity around rehosting is, is just better performance, something that we see with our customers as generally um, uh, will host workloads on systems that have much more capacity, much uh, higher class of system and have more scalability than individual organizations will, will have, you know, in their in their uh, in their shop. And that can improve uh, the near term operations, take pressure off the business. Um, even before any work, major workload or code changes could take place. So that's another um, advantage. Um, and many service providers are delivering mainframe, mainframe as a service billing on a consumption basis, just like you would see in public cloud uh, with the ability to adjust capacity and utilization uh, you know, as those workloads um, you know, reduce over that, that migration life cycle, over that modernization life cycle. Uh, a lot of the organizations that we talk to kind of struggle with this and end up paying a, a, a lot for for unused capacity, you know, over that bridge period while they modernize. Um, and then I guess lastly, you know, rehosting can really jumpstart that modernization effort. Um, it's not an exclusive strategy; it can be used in combination with these other two strategies, and is kind of the most common starting point for. Uh, organizations that are trying to fuel a modernization effort while reducing risk and position themselves to to kind of take their next steps. Um, you know, many IT shops have a goal of getting out of the data center kind of just as a practice. And, and very often the mainframe is the last platform standing in the data center. It's the last the last thing to turn the lights off on. Uh, and that's often because it's so central, uh, you know, doing core processing or the high transaction types of applications that are real central. Um, so additionally, uh, you know, the, the, those cost reductions come from a rehosting effort can get funneled into other modernization efforts. I think that's a real key factor, uh, not just not to mention just freeing up you know, technology resources to focus on those future state efforts. Right. 
Um, so with that, um, that's a little bit about rehosting. Uh, Walter, what can you tell us uh, about the, refa the refactoring approach? Mute. Helps if I unmute. Sorry about that. Thank you, sir. Um, and I know we've worked together where, you know, the mainframe has been the last bit to be moved. Uh, and refactoring is an option for some people. Um, I'd like to talk about just refactoring in the industry as well as refactoring from a Stadia's point of view, if I could here. Um, there is kind of a philosophical difference when an organization is kind of faced with a scenario where they say, we need to move away from some of the technologies that we have today. We can't find COBOL programmers or natural programmers or even worse, uh, systems and assembler programmers. Uh, they need to find an alternative. And there's this philosophical approach that says when people are trying to use automated tools, refactoring, to get to the new environment, um, they can follow one of two paths. They can go in and do business rule mining, uh, which says, I'm going to go find all of the logic that makes this application unique. I'm going to pull it out and through some level of automation and through a lot of work with really smart people who rewrite that code and start to modernize it, they can all put it back together again. And that's a very viable approach for, for many organizations. The other side of that spectrum is the, the approach that we at Estadia take. Uh, and that's to say that the, the business logic, the business rules that are in that application are the most important part of what a company does because it defines how that company is different than every other company. So rather than take the risk of pulling that out and altering it and putting it back together, we do more of a isofunctional replacement where we're still using automated tooling to be able to convert from one language set to another. So we could take a COBOL or an assembler or an ADZO or a natural and convert that to C sharp or Java as examples. Um, we think that no matter what method that people use for refactoring, going from one environment to another, once they do come off of the mainframe, keeping risk to a minimum is paramount. Um, we think that it's important to use automation as much as possible. So the higher the level of automation, the less chance there is for human failure along the way. And whether you're doing more automation or a mix of automation and human work together, one of the real keys is automated testing. Um, you know, historically, migrations away from the mainframe have followed a very waterfall type approach. It, you know, you kind of get into a project and you start converting code and then you reach a point and you start converting data and then you reach a point and you start testing. Uh, and unfortunately, what that has done over the years has made it more difficult for organizations to continually respond to changing business needs or government regulation requirements where things are changing, where they're told, and we have told them this in the past, you know, you can only do four retrofits during this year's project. We'll convert the code up to four times, uh, but if in that last month you have to make a change, there's a challenge to fit the schedule. The automated testing and the high level of automation can lead to, for many customers, a change in that, that paradigm. Uh, they're not tied to that waterfall cycle. They can start to be more agile. So that means that as they're starting to convert the code, if you can convert the code every day and you can convert the data every day and you can test every day in this process, you, you tighten the access to having a successful migration. Um, and we think that that's important. There's nothing scarier than when someone's getting off that wonderful mainframe platform and they're ready to go live and they're afraid to push that button like, boy, I sure hope we got this right. Uh, if instead they have the ability to say, you know what, we've done this conversion every day for a month prior to this go live, then it's just one more time for them. 
And we think that that's really important and something that refactoring, at least from my perspective, offers as an advantage over someone who would might rewrite an application from scratch. Obviously, that takes longer. There's more testing involved and there's more that can go wrong. The other things that are important, I feel, for refactoring is are um, ensuring that you have the right level of code flexibility. We see this often, and I, I suspect y'all may as well. We talk to clients who say, you know what, we're blessed. We've got a, a team of 50-year-old COBOL programmers who are going to be with us for another 15 years. But we do have a corporate direction. We want to move to C Sharp as an example, uh, as our method of working with code moving forward. Uh, and we want to train these COBOL programmers on how to use C Sharp. Well, for those people, converted code via tooling that is more similar in nature to the COBOL that they wrote originally and that they understand gives them a way to start to learn the new language. On the other end of the spectrum, we have clients who say, my last COBOL programmer just retired last week. He walked out the door and with him walking out the door was all of his tribal knowledge of the way these applications are built and why they were built that way. And in that scenario, uh, they need people who maybe understand C Sharp, but would never have understood the COBOL business logic. So we think it's important to have the alternative to have code that can be generated all along that continuum, uh, more easily understood by the classic COBOL programmer or more easily picked up by the person who has to now start to understand what that logic does. And again, that's a scenario where we think leaving, excuse me, leaving the business rules intact is so important because that tribal knowledge that walked out the door, if you're changing that logic in any way, you take the risk of missing something we feel. Um, the other component that's important is integration uh, to all of those components that we talked about before. You know, we can convert, and we did this recently, uh, 6,000 COBOL programs to Java in a day, physically converting them. That's the easy part. But you also have to take into account, how do I integrate that with everything else? Uh, or is my system talking to distributed systems or cloud systems today? Uh, is it talking to other mainframes today? And you have to account for those things. Uh, we also want to always ensure with refactoring, especially when we're going from one data source to another, that we allot time for the tuning of the environment. There are always going to be differences in the way systems perform. You're taking a uh, very well-structured environment that's tuned for the mainframe today, and you have to ensure that you get the same level of performance off of the mainframe in the new world. So everyone should expect to have tuning as part of that process. But when you combine all of those things using the high level of automation of the tools, automated testing, a methodology that says, we're gonna do this every day during this process until we know we have it right, well ahead of go, go live time. We think that it, it really gives people the flexibility and security that they, they want and need. So refactoring to us is a very viable, great approach, but replatforming also is. Scott, I'd be interested to know your experiences and your thoughts about replatforming as a, a solution alternative. Yeah, Walter, thank you. So uh, in terms of, of replatforming, it is an option and it's one that's traditionally been used. Um, and what we're seeing, at least from a trend perspective is that more and more clients are moving to the, the rehost option because they're looking to extend the life of their mainframe and integrate it with the cloud. They're choosing to refactor uh, because of the drivers that you said, uh, the skills issues. But the replatform has a place when skills is not an issue and also when it comes to timing. So for those clients that they have the skills they have the employees who they know COBOL, they know PL1, they know Assembler. Uh, 
moving to a distributed architecture, taking that environment and re replatforming it in the cloud or on-prem uh, is an option. So this is where COBOL stays as COBOL, PL1 stays as PL1. Assembler, that will typically be replaced either by system functions uh, or will be rewritten. Uh, but this is one where we see the market is starting to shift because of trends and because of the preponderance of, of uh, people skilled in Java and C Sharp. Uh, one of the things that we do see is also the integration into a more modern DevOps environment. And again, this is one where the, the refactor and the rehost plays very well. Uh, Replatform is there as well. We support both. Uh, Eclipse for Java, as well as your traditional Visual Studio environment. So we've been doing this now since probably 2009, and it's only growing. And the reason being is that customers are looking for more agile uh, platform. And with that agility is also, and knowing the duration of these projects, these are not short-term projects, you have to be able to take advantage of the options that are out there, the rehosting and the refactoring. And in a lot of cases, these projects can encompass one or more of these methodologies, depending on the scope and complexity of the environment. And we see it everything from tens of MIPS up to hundreds of thousands of MIPS. So it's really, it's, it's something, it's a mature environment, but, uh, we as as a team are well positioned to be able to mitigate the risk and really take advantage of what your your experience is where do you want to be in one three and five years and it's really around the art of the possible absolutely great <clears throat> thank you so you know there's kind of our three re's of an overview now those on the call are probably like um, you know, how do I start this process? What does my environment look like? And Walter, I'm sure some of the very first questions you get when a client comes to you is the big two things. What's it going to cost me and how long is it going to take me? And I'm sure, you know, as we all know, that's a, a big variant, right, based on the size of the environment that they're looking to modernize. So um, Walter is going to be showing us now kind of some case study examples. So hopefully each of you on the call can really look at start thinking about your environment and we really laid it out on a small, medium and large scale and see where your organization fits in there to start giving you an idea of when you're starting to plan on budgets and timing like that um, on average of what to expect. So Walter, why don't you go ahead and, and talk about our first thank, case. Thank study you very here. much, Dan. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah, we wanted to kind of break this down into small, medium and large and large is a very encompassing area. Oftentimes large is, uh, you know, it's a group of larges together. Um, it's not saying that large has to be a 300,000 MIP mainframe environment, but it might be a 300,000 MIP mainframe environment broken into 30 different pieces uh, in that regard. Uh, starting out with small, and these are all refactoring uh, case studies that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the province of Alberta, the government there, their um, Department of Justice uh, needed to move from an environment where they were in IDMS and COBOL. And we see this more and more where the ISV tools that can run on the mainframe, people are looking for alternatives for them to be able to get a more flexibility in their spend. Um, this wasn't a particularly large environment. There were uh, around 800 ADZO applications and uh, you know maybe a million lines of code. So it wasn't an environment that uh, was overly challenging from that perspective, but using the automated tooling in place, this was, uh, it took about a year for about a million bucks, million two, I think it was. Um, and the savings, and this is going to be true kind of throughout, depending upon the technologies that are in play, uh, the savings can range from 60 to 90 percent. 
especially for the organizations where there's large ISB spend on some of the third party tooling that is out there. Um, that's where things really start to, to come into play. Um, this was a, a relatively small team that worked on this. And importantly as well, the province Alberta didn't have to invest a ton of their time in this. One of the challenges that many organizations face is that they're continuing to do their day-to-day -day work. Uh, and it was important for this particular customer to be able to ensure that they could allot minimum resources possible to the conversion effort here. Uh, they were involved in the testing as it went along, but not heavily involved. Uh, and so that gave them the flexibility to keep the lights on, keep the wheels turning while this conversion went on. So this was small ADZO, IDMS, and COBOL. If we wanted to look at the uh, a medium option, instead. Uh, in Europe, the Deutsche Bank Asset Management Group, uh, that's focused on shareholder services for Deutsche Bank. Um, it's used by, as it says here, over 2,500 users. And the goal here was to address what was becoming a very impending skill shortage. That scenario that I mentioned before, where the last COBOL programmers were getting ready to walk out the door, uh, and actually, in this case, it was natural programmers getting ready to walk out the door. Um, also, there were the fact that it was tied to natural. Um, it was limiting somewhat what Deutsche Bank could do to extend those applications to move forward. Uh, and as I mentioned before, with the ISV swaps, they had a real goal for reducing that overall IT cost. There were multiple ZOS platforms involved here, Natural, Adabase, and something called Entire X, if any of you have ever worked with it before. And they wanted to go to a Windows environment. So Windows was SQL Server, uh, C Sharp, and the Entire X was something that wasn't handled in an automated fashion, but we were able to convert it to COM for them as they moved forward. Now, in terms of size, uh, as opposed to the smaller environment, this was over 1.3 million lines of natural code. And when you think about natural, which is, you know, uh, a 4GL in the sense that it's going to generate something much bigger, it's interpretive in nature, uh, that was probably equivalent to 5 million lines worth of COBOL code. And the data that was there was really important. There was over five terabytes of database data associated with this environment uh, and over 10 terabytes of sequential data. And for those who haven't gone through a mainframe migration, excuse me, mainframe migration, uh, you want to start thinking early on about how you're able to convert that data in a timely fashion. Uh, you can't just convert 15 terabytes of data in uh, a weekend necessarily. You've got to plan to determine, uh, do I need to incorporate things like change data capture? Or are there static pieces of data that I can convert ahead of time and only convert at cutover those things that have been changing since the last time that you, you did this? This was uh, about a a little less than two year project. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with the amount of data that was there and the entire X. And it, for the cost, it was about $3 million, but they were able to save somewhere between 60 and 70% on their corporate spend for IT associated with the mainframe after doing this project. So their ROI was uh, really strong and it made it an easy decision for them. Then if we could go to the larger case study, uh, and this one I think is quite interesting because it had its own unique challenges, not the least of which was that um, COVID came about about midway through this project effort. Uh, and so we all learned a lot during that. Uh, Foyer Group is Luxembourg's largest insurance company. Uh, and th so they have a core insurance application one of the things that Foyer was facing was 
their overall corporate digital transformation initiatives were kind of being stymied by the mainframe. It was that piece sitting back in the corner that Chris talked about before, maybe the last thing that comes off where they weren't able to be as responsive to their changing business needs uh, and to be as competitive against organizations that weren't tied to brick and mortar environments and could be more responsive to everyone. Um, they also were interested in being able to ensure shorter development times. So as Scott alluded to, uh, ensuring that DevOps became part of the process of migration, transitioning from that waterfall methodology that I talked about before into an agile methodology. Uh, and all of that was to be able to be more responsive to business needs. In their environment, they were um, pretty straight and narrow in terms of technologies, other than the fact that they had a great amount of EGL. And EGL, for those who may not know, is a, a 4GL language, again, that can generate other code. Um, so there was a, a desire to move to, as opposed to the last environment, to Windows. This was to Linux with DB2, LUW, and Java. Uh, when we look at some of the metrics there, we see that it's obviously quite a bit larger, 3 million lines of COBOL code and a lot of COBOL programs, uh, 7,100 EGL programs, um, and a large number of database tables, uh, specifically DB2. And as I mentioned, right in the middle of this project, COVID came along. So all of a sudden, people weren't going to offices. People were having to learn how to do things remotely, how to have do testing differently than we would before. So this project obviously took longer, uh, but even with a spend of a little less than $7 million, uh, Foyer was looking at 80% overall cost savings. So when we look at these three scenarios from 60 to 80% and timeframes of a year to, in this long ranging case, a little less than three years, uh, people are now positioned, we feel and hope, to leverage some of the things that we saw as benefits here, incorporating DevOps, uh, being able to train new people in new environments, not having to worry about the skill shortage. So whether it's small, medium or large, those overall goals uh, and the overall benefits we think are pretty consistent as they are, uh, as every organization looks at their alternatives. Thanks. Great, thank you. I think a key takeaway there, right, is this is a marathon, Indeed. not a sprint, you know, as far as level setting expectations internally. Um, and it really all just depends on the size of the application and environment when all said and done. A follow-up question on that, Walter. Um, when a client comes to you guys, how often is it they want all of their applications rewritten or maybe it's just one or two to start and build a roadmap to that? Like, what are you seeing in that um, That's environment? That's a really today? intriguing question. Um, and I think it has changed over time. This is somewhat evolutionary. When we were converting people off the mainframe 20 years ago, they were smaller in size. You know, it was the 100 MIP or the 200 MIP mainframe, and they wanted the, to turn the lights off. They wanted to start to save money as quickly as possible. The 100 to 200 MIPs then became 500 and 1,000 and 2,000. And this is surprising, I'll admit even to me, that today we are actually talking to 100,000 and 200,000 and 300,000 MIP mainframe customers. So as we're starting to talk to larger customers, I think we're starting to see more of a transition to a, a hybrid model where people are now looking for moving portions of their applications, but not everything at once. Um, and I'll go back to what we talked about before with the assessment. One of the things that we do more often now is to do a, a portfolio rationalization where we can help people identify what are the best candidates to move early and to understand how they relate back to the applications that are probably always going to be on the mainframe. Um, 
And it's important that people understand the level of effort and the trade-offs that go along with that. Um, and equally important that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. Um, that there can be a split where it is that hybrid model that is appropriate for them that may not be appropriate for their competitor down the street. Uh, and each one needs to be looked at. Great. You know, and that's kind of one of the beauties, right, of that rehosting strategy to start with, too, is move everything, get out of owning and operating the hardware. And then in the background, you can start to do the application rewrite. And some of those things may stay in a rehosting environment, right, and never move that's over exactly to right. your point. They just keep them as is. And then you have more of that hybrid environment moving on. So there's multiple options and flexibility, I think, is, is key here um, for people to know it's not a one size fits all and um, got to move everything or nothing. Kind exactly. Of scenario. Great. All right. Well, let's move on. Um, you know, I think another important thing, right, when you're kind of starting this journey is, you know, what what are some lessons learned and some roadblocks and considerations for the audience to think about when uh, modernizing? And you can all jump in on this one. Well, I think, Dan, you hit on kind of one of the first big ones, which is that, you know, it's it's not one size fits all. And then it's it's very often a lengthy process. The, the road to modernization is one that has usually multiple stages and, and the efforts that, you know, I led in, in as my former life as a CIO. Um, one of the big things is getting the organization to to make that shift, uh, you know, and that it's not going to be a, 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 one, a one and done event and, and that it's it's all over, that there's multiple stages. And very often, particularly, in, you know, in the larger uh, environments, as Walter was saying, the complexities really kind of drive that multi-cloud strategy that you're putting the right workloads in the right place for the, the, to be the, the, to come up with the best, you know, cost effectiveness, the best performance for what they do. And that's really kind of part of that process. Uh, but, you know, getting your organization to, uh, uh, you know, align around that concept of, you know, a, an iterative process of, 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 of modernization is really key. Yeah, and if I could add on to that, we see from, from our perspective, you must have the, the buy-in uh, from the executive level, because without that, the project is at risk. So we've seen it where the C-level is involved, where the board level gets involved, especially when you're dealing with, with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of MIPS, because then it's typically a strategic decision that can span multiple years. Uh, you know, in terms of, of other roadblocks, there's always budgetary considerations that need to be taken into account, which again, could span multiple years. So you want to make sure that, that you have uh, executive sponsor, sponsorship on this. Uh, you want to make sure that you've done the portfolio rationalization properly. You've taken into account not only the from, from the dev, test, and production, but the third-party utilities. You want to look into security considerations. What are you doing today around RACF and Top Secret and how best to integrate that into, for example, Active Directory, whether on-prem or in Azure? So really that, that upfront assessment is critical to understand that. And in terms of how to conduct that assessment, it can be done manually. There are automated tools out there. Uh, so you really have a wide range of options in terms of looking at your, your environment. Scott, if I could add too, and I totally agree with you about the uh, involvement and um, agreement from the C-level teams, um, ensuring that organizations are able to leverage the the on the floor people the people who have the knowledge of the applications uh, is equally important having their buy-in can really be critical as well and in terms of roadblocks one of the biggest challenges that we're facing in this time where baby boomers are starting to retire is that tribal knowledge that i talked about before uh, is no longer available so that's why it's important, I think, for organizations to kind of get ahead of the curve and say, before this becomes a problem, you know, let's look at what our alternatives might be, whether it's rehost or replatform or refactor, uh, but to take advantage of the resources that are going to be critical at the time that they're available.
I think another consideration too is that um, whereas a number of years ago, you know, IT organizations will very often have kind of the autonomy just go off and do something like this. And, you know, as, as you refer to Scott, and it's very much become a, a you know, a, a business leadership board level kind of involvement and decision. There's a lot more um, direct um, engagement there from from the, the C levels and organizations on, on on projects like this. Um, you know, and then and secondarily too, um, there are a lot more players involved, and it's important to build trust across the folks that are working with you in a modernization lifecycle, particularly because it is such a lengthy process that you've got you know, um, uh, you know a, a tight um, alignment of the internal and the partner resources that are working uh, you know, to build, deliver that modernization you know, roadmap and, and get the right outcome. Yeah, and it's it spans vertical markets as well. I mean, if you're dealing with a manufacturing customer, there are supply chain considerations, uh, inventory management. If you're dealing with uh, financial services, do we need to look at the core banking environment and applications and everything that ties into that? So it's it's very important to to have a holistic view of of the environment. And as you said, Walter, get you need to get buy-in from the lines of businesses that are engaged. Yeah, absolutely. It, it needs to be a concerted effort uh, internally to an organization and with the partners with whom they work. Um, and the one other thing I would add, and we talked about this a little bit before, understanding that environment and understanding the mapping of where you're going to go as early in the process as possible is critical. Uh, you don't want to wait until the last moment to decide, oh my goodness, I've got this, uh, this third party component that I really had not considered. So doing that in a very structured manner in a very consistent manner is, uh, is quite critical, I think. Great. Anything else the panel would like to add on this one? I think that's it for me. All right. Okay. Well, at this time, we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions. As a reminder, if you would like to field a, have the panel field your question, type it into the uh, chat box on the right there. And we'll go ahead and get started. So the first one is from uh, Bernhard. What are your guidelines for mapping mainframe applications to three, three Re's? Questionnaire or interview? I'll I'll start, and you know, please feel free to jump on, uh, Bernhard. That's a great question. Um, it's a combination. There are spreadsheets that are very, are available um, that span business questions, technology questions. What's your current environment? Number of developers, applications. But then there are also automated tools that will go out and interrogate the environment. So it's really, and, and interviews are also a critical part of that because there are things that come out of the face-to-face -face that cannot be captured in a, in a questionnaire. Scott, I, I absolutely agree. I, I think it is questionnaire, interview, and the technical tools that offer the broadest picture in terms of what the best options might be. Um, I remember when I did my first mainframe migration in 1994, I had no clue what I was doing. Didn't know what to look for. And I learned a lot of what not to do. And it was a manual effort that we went through back then. Um, so I always think back to my first time, I wish I had known ahead of time. So a questionnaire for our perspective is it's very helpful to kind of paint a broad picture of you know, how big is this bread box? Uh, is this going to take a year? Is it going to take three years? Is it going to cost $500,000 or $5 million? Uh, a questionnaire can lead to some information that hopefully helps people say, this is worth exploring. Um, but a questionnaire is just an answer that someone provides, and it's going to have some level of accuracy to it, but it gets people in the ballpark, hopefully. The Interviews, I think, are extremely critical to understand, Scott, as you mentioned, the things that you can't get just from a questionnaire or even from having the automated tools look at code. There are components as to why an application was put together a certain way. 
and why the performance of a certain portion of an application is critical that you only get through that questionnaire interview portion. And then the tools themselves that kind of go through and, and parse everything and see how it all fits together, that's where you can start to get some of the, as I mentioned before, the characteristics of an application, the, you know, what's the cyclomatic complexity of, of this environment? Am I better suited to rewrite it, to rehost it, leave it in the mainframe environment, replatform or refactor? Because there will be characteristics that are driven from that, that point you in one direction more than another. Um, so yeah, I, I like you, Scott, think that it's kind of all three of those that are kind of the, the set of tools that drive you to mapping which re might be best for each organization. Great. Our next question is, what are some of the typical challenges in general of data migration that you guys see? Bad data. Uh, <laughs> the, you, you hate to ever think that there's garbage data out there, but people who started writing applications 40 years ago when uh, DASD was at a premium and you would have one field that might be comp three and a pick X and something else and a bit set of bit flags, uh, depending upon scenarios. Uh, over the years, applications too often let data be put in where those are all valid options, but the data itself was bad. Um, and I view this as an opportunity for people to say, this is an ideal time to go through and cleanse the data as I go through this process to ensure that I have data moving forward that um, you know fits the bill and is accurate. And then the performance, if you're going from a non-relational model to a relational model, ensuring that you have the same level of performance. And that's the tuning that I was talking about before, where you will need to expect that you'll want to uh, ensure that you're getting that level of performance that you had before. Okay. Uh, we we'll probably have time for one more question. And Chris, this one would be directed at you. Um, Paul Lock, I hope, I hope I'm saying your name right there, uh, is asking for the rehosting option, would you have case studies and cost benefits achieved you can share? Yeah, certainly we do, and um, you know we can we can certainly share those you know uh, in in bulk. But in general, um, you know, as I you know, referred to, you know, most of the, the the benefits achieved you know are around you know more tactically the you know the cost reduction and the, the you know the the ability to shift your team's um, uh, mode of operations from you know focusing on 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 operational delivery to one that's focused on modernization, meeting those those business and organizational needs, and and in partnering with organizations that are going to do the do the delivery in a, in a resilient, uh, secure, and, and low risk kind of way. So you know, we can certainly provide some of that. But that's, that's kind of a, a nutshell what uh, you know, we see you know, working with our partners. Yeah, and I believe at FNTS we kind of say on average, uh, just from the rehosting model, um, typically we see our clients save about twenty percent annually um, by going to that uh, model. So, and it varies on size. All right. Well, that uh, concludes the webinar today. So I hope everybody in the audience, you know, was really maybe if you're looking to modernize, you're in the modernization process. Uh, hopefully, you know, A, you're not alone. <laughs> this is out, everybody's out there doing that today. And hopefully you're able to get some nuggets and, and self-identify, oh, we can, you know, um, implement some of these strategies and things like that as well. Obviously, Microsoft, Estadia, and FNTS, we're all here to help. Um, so if you do need any uh, further, or want any further information or consultation, how to get started, things like that, uh, be sure to reach out to the team afterwards and uh, we can help you with that as well. And uh, with that said, here's uh, the, the gentleman on the panel's contact information. Uh, we included their LinkedIn profile. They'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Um, you know, it's kind of the new way to network these days. And uh, we will um, hopefully be doing another one of these webinars in the future. 
And with that, I will sign off and once again, thank our panel for all their expertise. Thanks, Thanks, Dan. Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye. Thanks, Gabe. Good seeing you.